Thank you for coming to our session, uh, which is going to be creative approaches for teaching entrepreneurship. So we do have a really international panel of speakers here. Uh, the three speakers, I think you're from Australia, yep. Italy, and also Mexico. Mexico, uh, Slovakia. Okay, <laughs> all right. So uh, we have uh, two presentations. Each uh, group of speakers will have 14 minutes to give the talk. And after both speakers have uh, you know, given their talk, we will open it up for minutes. All right. So we will hear first from uh, Lady. Um, the Deakin Business School from Australia to talk about seven models of uh, an entrepreneurial experience workshop here. Thank you very much. Brought my own timer. I have a tendency to run over time, so I made a commitment to stick to the 14 minutes. Today's session was designed to be um, a workshop to show how we uh, deliver the business development clinic as an entrepreneurial experience, learning experience at a university. I had 50 minutes, so I had it all worked out. <coughs> Flew in from Australia, it got cut to 20 minutes, and then it's got cut to 14 minutes. So <laughs> it's a couple of slides I'll probably whiz through. Uh, so the introductions, I'll talk to, uh, to you about myself and my co-author, who's uh, an entrepreneur in his uh, career. Uh, we work with the Work Integrated Learning System, Work Integrated Learning Division, if you like, Department of the Business School at Deakin. We've developed the Business Development Clinic as a learning experience inside that program. Um, I'll just quickly show you through the assessments that we use and then, excuse me, uh, the seven levers framework that we've developed to help students when they're consulting with clients. I'll give you a little more in-depth look at that. The math behind that, we run through with the students uh, how the impact financially of what they do and deliver with their clients can be calculated and, and uh, forecast. Uh, and the associated skills that we teach, I won't spend much time on that, but I'll touch on some of those things that we teach in addition to the use of the framework. And then with the conclusion. My background before I got into academia was in marketing. And my last uh, career job, paid salary, before I got into academia was uh, marketing manager of West Australian newspaper. So I started a publishing business, we grew that and sold it, and we started, a, we floated a company on the exchange, we did a number of really interesting entrepreneurial things. Went back to uni to get some financial knowledge that I thought I was missing, and that's how I got kind of sucked into education. But I get that, it's the second half of my career and it's a part that I really enjoy. Really enjoy working with young people. Uh, Pete Williams is, uh, we have Pete um, as a professor of practice, uh, with our business school. Pete's a, a part-timer, if you like. He's an entrepreneur in his own right. And he's an award-winning author uh, of a business book called Cadence. So those of you who are interested towards the end of the talk today, if you're interested in a copy of that, they're free of charge. Just come up and we can have a chat. I'm happy to give you a copy of that. So I work together with a real entrepreneur. I do the academic side and together we deliver this program. So work integrated learning is about developing students' employability through experiences in professional environments working on the kinds of tasks that are typically assigned to graduates. And they take many forms. Business schools use those. What we've developed though is the capacity to work very effectively with live case studies. And there's some big issues with that. The supply of live case studies is an issue. And we've come up with a really neat way of getting a continuous sustainable supply of live case studies. So before I start, what I'd like to do, could you all stand up with me for a second? Yep. I'm just gonna play a quick game. Just playing a quick game. What I'd like you to do, looking at the board there, at the, at the screen, I'd like you to have a look at the numbers. Now, I'm gonna give you 30 seconds. What I'd like each of you to do quietly is to go through the sequence, finding the numbers from one in the top left and you can see moving to two, kind of in the middle. At your own pace, 30 seconds, go through the sequence to see what number you get to. 30 seconds from now, starting with one. They're different shapes, they're different sizes, they're in different places, they're not in sequence. And everyone goes at their own pace, interestingly. Does that feel like 30 seconds to you? 
Getting close to 30 seconds, the pressure's on. How intelligent are you compared to everybody else? Yes. <laughs> okay, let's call that 30 seconds. Now, can I just ask around the room? Grab a seat, thanks. I find students stick better when you make them move. So you sample students today. What number did you get to? 15. 15, not a bad result. Seven. Number seven. We have quite a lot of people that stay in the single figures. Don't feel embarrassed, it's not an issue. 13. Anybody over 20? 20? 20? 24. 24? 46. How many? 46. 44. Oh my God. He's by five. There's only 23 numbers. <laughs> okay, thanks. So keep that in your pocket. I'll come back to that. So the objective of the Business Development Clinic is to help uh, students focus on strategic work for SMEs and entrepreneurial startups. The idea being that they're time staffed. They don't have the focus really usually to do strategic thinking work on their business. So the objective of the clinic is to bring them together to undertake a strategic plan um, for the organization, for the startup, for the SME. And it's around building the development of the organization through sales and profitability really. So we bring together student consultancy teams, they work with the SMEs, and they develop strategies. I'll take you through that framework in a minute. So they engage in a combination of program tailored content, hands-on project work, client meetings, team meetings, and mentor sessions. We've been doing this now for five years. We've done these strategic plans for over 120 businesses. And we have gone, we've had about 600 students through the program. <laughs> the interesting thing is, we have a lot of document feedback from the students about how satisfied they are. And we have a very high rating, typically 95% from student ratings of the program. <laughs> we have anecdotal feedback from the businesses, and they're usually delighted to work with the students, all the normal stuff that you get from a business with that kind of attention on their business. Um, we don't have a lot of detail on the businesses and how they use the program after they've come through the clinic with us. My favourite part of working and educating is recreating the look in their eyes. Look at these kids. They haven't been told it's not possible to fly in a cardboard box. Their imaginations are on fire. I love that. And that's what we try and do with the clinic to bring them to that kind of innovative, creative, entrepreneurial mindset. We call it mindset. This is typical of the feedback we get from students. Of all the units I did across my degree, the business clinic was the most practical and engaging one that really pushed me out of my comfort zone and taught me things about businesses and myself that I would not have learned otherwise. Typical kind of feedback. Now, this is a very popular successful business in Australia right now called Oh Crap. <laughs> uh, they make compostable dog bags. The owner said of our program, he's thankful that we introduced the seven leaders framework to a business. We'll still be using it as the backbone of what we do, hopefully all the way up to $100 million. So feedback has been anecdotally really very pleasing. The students do assessments, so they write a report after they've done this consulting process. They do a presentation to the client, including an implementation plan. They produce a con contribution diary. Tried peer review, tried a whole lot of other ways of working out a value for students' contribution. Turns out they're very honest when they're making themselves. So we have a very detailed diary asking questions about what did you contribute in that particular meeting to the concepts. And there's self-development, uh, skill development, and uh, self-reflection report at the end as well. Now, getting back to that structure, imagine putting, okay, we'll go through the framework quickly. We uh, formulate seven steps in the process of a business, seven key things an SME needs to do. 
getting people to notice the business, getting people to interact with it, getting people to buy from the business, getting them to buy the most expensive items, getting them to buy as many items as possible, getting them to come back and buy from you again, and keeping the most amount of money in your pocket. So we've developed from that, or Pete has developed from that, the seven levers framework. So you can see each of those activities on one canvas, borrowed from the lean canvas uh, strategy work. Now, I'll introduce Pete and get him to explain Hey everybody, Pete Williams here, and thank you so much for having me virtually. Uh, Wayne, you're doing a fantastic job, I hope. Uh, this has been pre recorded, but good job so far, mate. Round of applause, quickly. And here's the model that we actually use have to work inside with. our business development clinics here at Deakin. It's a model that makes understanding their business doing some strategic planning uh, and a bit of a health check super uh, understandable for our um, business clients, but also really easy for our students to grasp, learn and implement. So what you now see on the screen uh, is a business. It's a rectangle, but it is a hairdresser. It is a accounting firm. It is a wholesale manufacturer. Whatever the business is, uh, we represent that as the starting point in our framework or canvas. Now, for any business, whether you are a for-profit or even a non-profit, at the end of the day, most business owners are here to make money. So let's start and put it in the bottom line first to represent what drives the purpose of what we're doing. Then the question becomes, what does drive that bottom line in a business? And there's really three factors <coughs> that drive that. You have the sales funnel, you have the front-end revenue, and you have the back-end revenue. Now we try and go one layer deeper in this initial model. There's a lot of depth in here that we don't have time to go through today, of course. But if you look at the sales funnel, that is driven or broken up by three components. You have the suspects. These are the people that you suspect might be potential customers for your business. That then follows into prospects. These are the group of people, the subset, that have put up their hand, they've tried on the dress, they've taken the free trial, they've gone for the test drive of your car, whatever it might be, that is a micro-commitment to get them closer to being a customer. Every business has that micro-commitment step whether they realise it or not. And that's what defines a prospect. From there, obviously, you're trying to get as many of those prospects to become customers and clients and convert uh, into your business. The front-end revenue is also broken up by two factors. The first thing we've got is average item price. What is the average price of the goods or services or products that you sell to your customers? And then on average, how many products are they buying each transaction? We all know the overused analogy that is from McDonald's, would you like fries with that? That's what this box represents, or is asking, how are you getting people to buy the fries with the hamburger? Then you've got your back-end revenue. How often are people coming back and transacting from you again? And what are you doing to drive that? And all this sits on top of our margins or our expenses. So this model allows a business, uh, through our cons you know, consulting clients, the students, uh, to actually understand what are the factors that drive the revenue and the profit through our client's business. We can use this uh, canvas or this tool to obviously understand how they define each of these areas because a suspect for a hairdresser is going to be very, very different to a suspect for a lawn mining business or, as I said before, an accounting firm or an e-commerce store, whatever it might be. Uh, we can also measure how many suspects do we actually have in this business over a particular period of time. How many prospects, what's our transactions per customer measure, we can use it in that way as well. And then finally, as um, Wayne will surely talk about, is the power of 10% wins and the impact that will happen to the profit of a business if we increase each of these levels or each of these areas by just 10%. So with that, I'll pass back to Wade, let him fill in the gaps that I've missed, or uh, we'll continue on the presentation. Again, thanks for having us today. Thanks, Pete. <laughs> Look, uh, I've got a copy of the canvas for anybody who's interested. You're welcome to take that with you with the contact details on it. Um, next speaker generously has offered a couple of more minutes for me to just finish off before we change over. So I'll cut right through to the key stuff, but the mathematics of this shows that with a 10% increase, excuse me, I don't want to waste time doing that. Um, 
each one of those seven stages, if we can get clients to improve by 10% each one of those elements that we show, doing that incrementally over seven periods, they can actually increase their revenue by up to 100%. Pure maths. A spreadsheet is used in that. So, um, just to quickly, one we do personality testing, teamwork, so they can fit in the team and see whose strengths are where. Um, consulting skills are part of it. We look at it as uh, an unofficial capstone unit because it draws from all the other units out of the, the business degree. So uh, I won't spend time on it. The conclusion is sourcing clients is the problem. So what I've done is I've formed a relationship with the Small Business Association of Australia, 40,000 members. We're running a series of webinars, one for each of those leaders. And in each of those, we offer the membership students to work with to come in and go into more detail and look through that program. So we have companies lining up to come into the program for us. Um, Postgrad clinic, we're asking them in their groups to approach their employers. So hopefully one out of each group will bring in a, an employer as a client. The gap in the business is about uh, gap in the literature. Businesses which we're um, producing a paper on, researching what the companies feel long term after they've done the program. Do they implement the steps? Do they take advantage of what they've got out of the program longer term. And that'll be a paper I'm happy to share in probably about six months. International partners are welcome. I put students together. We can do it virtually with clients. We can do it uh, in face-to-face -face classes. I love to work internationally. If we can put classes together with your students and my students working together with, say, an Australian company or working with a, an American company, uh, I'd love to hear from people who may be interested in joining a program of that nature. And final word, imagine, I'd like you to imagine, two similar soon-to-be college business school graduates being asked about their industry experience and the job interview. The first one says, well, I worked at Subway and I coached a basketball team. The student who's been through our business development clinic says, I led a consulting team for a startup business looking to rapidly build profitability. Using an industry framework, my team utilised primary and secondary data sources to develop and present a strategic plan that drove profit and seven easy steps that the company implemented successfully. Which one would you employ? Thank you very much. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, the role of hackathons in entrepreneurship education. So this is us, I'm a PhD <coughs> from the University of Actor in Norway and University of Turin in Italy. I'm currently a visiting scholar at ASU. Um, and I had the pleasure to also collaborate on a few projects uh, at the de Monterrey with, uh, with Jan, and this was one of them. So we're happy to present uh, this case study uh, to you today. Um, that really, really inspired some change at the university level and a lot of other projects came up with that. So a few challenges of entrepreneurship <coughs> educators, of course, we talked about it more extensively throughout the conference, uh, but definitely three of the ones that we're gonna uh, cover during this talk, keeping up with new technologies and learning styles, tap into the potential of the university's broader ecosystem, so not only uh, uh, siloed entrepreneurship courses or entrepreneurship faculties and foster a culture that values entrepreneurial skills and mindset across all academic disciplines. So this interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary, if we may, uh, way of perceiving um, entrepreneurship. Uh, how many of you know what, what is a hackathon? I think most of you. But uh, at the Baja experience, I heard some of you don't, didn't know about them, so I put here a, a definition. So hackathons were um, actually initially popularized by technology communities, so by software developers, app developers. Um, and they usually involve people working in teams from different backgrounds, experiences, and areas of expertise. Um, for a limited time, uh, so 24 to 72 hours uh, usually, to innovate and solve complex problems. So these problems were usually a software virus at the beginning, or maybe something to be fixed in, a, in an app. Um, later on, they were popularized by a few uh, 
of course, very innovative organizations such as Google that uh, brought up Startup Weekend and really popularized the concept of, of hackathons. NASA as well with the International Space App Challenge. Um, and the Lean Startup Movement created also the Lean Startup Machine, which is a kind of hackathon that follows that methodology very, uh, very much into detail. And then we also had the evolution of hackathons into more social space with uh, global goals jams uh, that focus on SDGs and social impact in general. And then, uh, of course, design sprints at Google follow a, a very similar approach of having uh, people from different departments working together and trying to solve big problems. Uh, sometimes they call them moonshot as well, uh, and test new ideas in just a few days and come up with very cool uh, ideas like um, Google Just Gmail. To come a little bit in the front end. It's hard to hear. Oh, it's hard to hear. Okay. okay. Yeah, sure. So I'll be here because otherwise I can't see exactly what I'm projecting. <laughs> and I'll try to speak a little bit louder. Um, and so some of the coolest ideas from, from Google came up from these type of approaches. So even some functions of Gmail or uh, other um, lucky features, the lucky find features uh, at Google um, for Google search. So really, a lot of uh, more organizations started to think about these type of contexts where, again, people are limited in time and are diverse in their backgrounds and need to solve something uh, that seems complex and, and, and new in, in innovative ways. Um, so this is how uh, the European Commission also thought of uh, bringing this approach to digital education uh, in Europe. So I've been fortunate enough to collaborate with the European Commission for uh, some years now and uh, be part of the design team of this uh, global hackathon. So, so far it's been uh, organized for three consecutive years uh, and it's under the Digital Education Action Plan. So there's a policy instrument that drives uh, this uh, this hackathon and it's now one of the biggest initiatives in Europe when it comes to uh, digital uh, education. So the whole idea is to have people talk and innovate on the future of education in the digital age uh, and so they really try to engage institutions from different types of uh, backgrounds, mostly education and training institutions uh, but to leverage the broader um, ecosystem they have around them to innovate on and co-create solutions for the future of, it, of education. And, uh, solutions that are appealing to their local ecosystems, right? So to the administrators, to the students, uh, to the professors as well. So uh, it's been an interesting experiment. It's been now uh, uh, for three years and it has involved 6,700 participants in Europe and beyond. And why beyond? Because Tech de Monterrey was the first one. We're going to talk about it uh, later. But let's just watch a very quick video for you to know a little bit more about the initiative. Digital skills are at the foundation of modern day learning and education. They enable, empower, and unite us worldwide. 90% of future jobs will require digital competency. Still almost half of Europeans lack basic digital skills. In all stages of life, from school through to college and into the workplace, the key to success lies in acquiring new digital competencies. DigiEduAppy was launched by the European Commission to develop innovative solutions to pressing challenges in digital education. For 24 hours, we will break continental barriers by connecting more than 50 organizations worldwide. Two and a half thousand students, educators, researchers, and innovators will work around the globe to come up with groundbreaking and fresh innovations in digital learning. We want to know, what does the future of learning look like? Will students wear virtual reality headsets? Will teachers use big data to support learning? Together, we can impact the European Union's digital policy making and co-create the future of our education. Technology, data exploitation, access, availability, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, augmented reality, 3D printing. 
We will dig deep to shape the very core of education. Shape the next generation learning by making digital tools and skills available to all. The best ideas will be awarded at an international award ceremony, celebrating the power of collaboration. This is history in the making. This is Digi Edumac. Join us as a host or participant to make your mark. All right, so this was just a little bit of uh, what happened, especially in the first edition. So uh, when I was involved, I was at the Euro uh, University of Turin only in Italy, and I started having a lot of these conversations, and these tools seemed to me so impactful and so interesting that I said, why only in Europe? And so I started talking to the uh, hosts and the general organizers at the European Commission, and I said, well, I have uh, met, I just recently started working with a university in Mexico that is really doing this and I believe they could really leverage this type of tool and maybe even expand it to Latin America in general. And so they rethought their, <laughs> uh, their approach and they said, yeah, why not? Let's also open it to, to other universities. So as you can see, this is the third edition, so it's a little bit uh, further, but more universities uh, followed. Uh, and now it became a, a global initiative. But again, uh, DG Educa at Tecnologico de Monterrey was the first um, uh, Latin American uh, edition. So in 2019, we partnered up with, uh, with Jan, and we said, let's try to, to bring this uh, to Mexico, especially we're both from uh, Europe. And we said, well, European Union and the European Commission has done a lot in terms of policies, and they could impact so much more uh, when maybe uh, uh, launching some initiatives in, in other countries. Um, so we've had three editions so far, so I'll be happy to uh, give the floor to Jan to uh, talk a little bit more about them. So um, it started as a pilot, as an experiment, of kind of a small edition um, in 2019, so a single campus level. And actually, the team from Tecnologico de Monterrey was awarded as the, one of the winning teams. So we had the chance to travel to Brussels, present it at the European Commission, and that was an amazing experience for, for these students. Uh, and then the second edition was um, expanded to seven campuses around Mexico. So of course, because of the winning team traveling to Brussels and having this experience, uh, it got the attention of many more students. And then uh, a very uh, interesting thing happened for the third edition when many more um, actors of the broader tech ecosystem uh, started to become interested and join forces. And so this was co-created uh, with the main actors of, of the ecosystem. So I'd be happy to, um, yeah. if you want to add something about so that. So this is where serendipity happens, right? A little bit similar to what's happening here at the conference. We met at a summer school. The idea came up. We were okay. Let's try pilot it at the one at the campus where I'm located. Uh, we did it in a month, right? So we had no resources. Like, try talking to your department chair and saying, "Well, I want to do a hackathon in a, in four weeks." So no resources, no budget. Uh, we found sponsors. We ran the first uh, first trial. It was fantastic. It was the last pre-pandemic edition. Um, so we like we got the library to let us stay there overnight. Uh, it, we broke probably half a dozen rules. Uh, so we did the hackathon. And curious enough, as Simona mentioned, our team got into the finals and then we won. I mean, there were three winners, right? So our team won, they got all expenses paid trip to Brussels to present it uh, to uh, the European commissioner and at the forum. And that's where Tech said, well, this is interesting. <laughs> what, what do you need? <laughs> so that was interesting. Then pandemic hit. So like the second and the third edition we did online. So it was a little bit easier to do uh, to do it for like invite all the campuses. As, as Simona mentioned, we we had seven campuses in the second edition, uh, about ninety students. And in the third edition, we did something curious. We learned from that what worked, what didn't. We opened it up. Uh, not only to, to tech, but we invited our Latin American partners. So we had some students for di from different Latin American universities uh, participating in the online, uh, online session. And we involved uh, the Entrepreneurship Center, uh, the Institute of Entrepreneurship of Tech. We involved the Institute for Future of Education of Tech. And we, we, we involved the, the Center for Professor Development. So we had the, the business school. So the four actors that have never worked before 
uh, in such a setting uh, together. Uh, we had to sit them at the table. It was very interesting. We had a few fights there uh, along the way, but that was a very interesting learning of this. Like, uh, and, and yeah, basically for us, for the entrepreneurship student, it was interesting because it was open to all the schools. So we had this multidisciplinarity, as Simona mentioned. Perfect. So some of the results uh, from the edition. So 92 of the participants evaluated very positively this experience and are recommending it. So we're looking forward to the new edition happening in, in 2023. We had a lot of impact on collaboration among campuses and ecosystem actors and also positive feedback received by the people who were involved as um, as, as staff, of, like mentors, expert coaches, they also learned a lot and now they're implementing these type of uh, tools and methodologies they learned through uh, DG Eduhack. So what was interesting was that since it's a European Commission uh, organized event, we received a lot of tools from them and then we replicated them in, in different uh, campuses. So that was very interesting and that gave the possibility for it to be organized in two months or one month Otherwise, it would have been really, really difficult. So we have some quotes from mentors, so the, the, how this, these type of initiatives can really add value to a global vision for the future of education and also how it can be eye-opening in terms of we can actually work all together as a university, not as just as the faculty of entrepreneurship, but we can actually work with the, the, the faculty for education, for, with the technologists, right, with scientists all together and this is possible, right? And so it was the proof that they, like all of these barriers exist, but maybe an event such a hackathon can really uh, break down these barriers. So the three takeaways we wanna bring to you are uh, the following. So hackathons are an amazing tool for educating on entrepreneurship. And they, um, so in terms of this, they really provide a hands-on experience peer learning, a uh, way to, uh, to practice complexity thinking, problem solving, creativity of course, design thinking can be one of the ways in which a hackathon can be organized and can really inspire students to pursue entrepreneurship careers because some of these students weren't in an entrepreneurship career but they had the chance in just two days practice what it means to at least start a business or pitch in front of investors and then they actually became interested in following this career. Takeaway number two is the um, benefit that educators can have in involving students and other actors through a hackathon to really ask them what they want to have uh, in their future learning experiences, right? So it's a co-creation uh, exercise that can lead to decision making and respond to community needs. And this is what tech has been doing in uh, finding out that uh, students were more and more interested in, in uh, um, practicing uh, digital skills, so they actually expanded the uh, digital uh, uh, tools area and people are even more and more engaged with these type of, of tools nowadays, so it was a way for them to really see, okay, what do our students need and want and propose and, and then kind of play with it and test. And the takeaway number three is more related to this ecosystem approach of universities, so these participatory initiatives can really give the broader community and the ecosystem actors uh, an opportunity to collaborate and very much practically and see that these barriers can be broken. So, and, and it can be a way to gather insights, to experiment, to iterate, to have this continuous uh, improvement loop. So we really recommend anyone to um, join such uh, initiatives. This is us at the European Commission. It's <laughs> <We're laughs> <winning. Wonder> prize. <laughs> And uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I have also one thing to, I would like to add perfect. to the takeaways because I think from the context of what we've been talking about here, uh, it's really interesting when you take entrepreneurship students of the entrepreneurship major and you mix them with completely different people with a challenge that has not really much to do with the business if you think about it. Like how do, how do you reimagine education? And they have to sit together with engineers, with educators, with mentors from different backgrounds and try to come up with solutions in 24 or 48 hours. Uh, and the methodology of DG Eduhack is it has to have a business model behind it, right? So that's where they come in. But it's very interesting to see these, uh, for example, the winning team, it was two entrepreneurship students, engineer and, and humanities student that made something of value. So, and th by the way, they still are, they're still work with that, uh, with the startup. I mean, one of them. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, so 
Uh, this is this is us, and we would be curious to talk to you about hackathons more and understand whether some of your uh, uh, faculties are already implementing this. It's I'm uh, working on this topic for my PhD thesis, so I would be happy to hear more from you. And so thank you very much for your attention. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.